Father God, we want to thank you for giving to us your word, and we acknowledge this morning that it was written by divine hands, and that, Lord, your fingerprint is embedded within that word. And I pray, Lord, as we start to look a little bit deeper underneath the surface this morning, you would show us things that we've not seen before, and we would go away with a sense of awe and glory with what you have done uh, when writing your word. May it bless us this morning, Lord. Bless us and, and enrich us, Lord. And uh, Father God, we pray that you would anoint me with your spirit and anoint our ears to be able to hear your voice in Jesus' name. Amen. Brilliant. Okay, so this morning's subject is something that we don't usually talk about. Some of you might have some insight into this. Some of you may not. Biblical numerology. Has anybody heard any talks or is familiar with the subject of biblical numerology? We've got a few people here. So, let's... Uh, numerology is the study of numbers. And uh, biblical numerology is the study of how numbers are used in the Bible. They're not just there randomly, they're put there by design. And there's another side to numerology, which is gematria, which is assigning numbers to letters, words and phrases, and then seeing significance in them. And that might not mean anything to you at the moment, but as we go on, I hope that it will start to make sense. But numbers are important to God. God created numbers and counting. Uh, he gave us numbers to use. And the Lord very specifically took six days to create the world and then rested on the seventh. And if we just look at a few verses here, then when he instituted the law of Moses, he used the creation as a method of establishing the Sabbath. You know, six days you shall, uh, shall work be done, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest. And when God created the sun and the moon, it was so times and seasons could be fixed. And times and seasons are calculated using what? Numbers. In uh, Leviticus, uh, it talks about on how on the 14th day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. So we've got a date set in place using numbers to be able to help the Israelites um, observe their feasts. So fit set, sets of lengths of time for the feasts calculated using numbers. You shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord for seven days. You know, the Lord commanded uh, uh, that sacrifices were made and they needed to be able to count to know when and for how long to offer sacrifices. So numbers were embedded into the mind of, the, uh, of Israel. And the Lord even commanded his people to count. He said, count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. He, there's actually commands in the Bible for us to count. So numbers are important to God and numbers should be important to us. In fact, if you were a Levitical priest serving in the tabernacle or the temple, you, you needed to know numbers and you needed to know how to count to be able to fulfill your service and your role. You know, the Lord counted his people in a census in Numbers 1.1. The Lord counted the years the Israelites failed to give the land rest and determine that would be the length of time that they would have exile in Babylon. The Lord had a has a specific number of Gentiles that need to be saved before he returns. And the Bible says that when the fullness of the Gentiles is completed, then he is able to appear and gather his church to himself. And the Lord fixed the number of apostles to be 12. Not 13, not 10, but 12. He, the Lord spent the whole night praying and the Lord showed him these are the 12 that you need to uh, um, select. And the word that he has transmitted to us via his servants is littered with numbers throughout, even to the point that there's a book called Numbers. And it is said that one in every five scriptural verses in the Bible contains a number. Numbers are important to God, so numbers should be important to uh, us. 
So when you look at the creation of man, say a house or a wall, and you get ever closer to man's creation, you start to see the imperfections. You start to see the lack of level, the lack of evenness. You, should, you know, uh, working as a plumber, I mean, we just plastered our room, haven't we? And it looks fantastic from a distance, but the closer you get to that wall, you see the little nicks and the little imperfections there. And I've never worked in a single bathroom where the walls are completely flat and, and the ceiling is completely true. I've even, I've even worked in a house where it was completely skew with. I stuck my head out the window and the wall is bowed right from the point of being built. You know, there's imperfections the closer you get to the work of uh, man. But look at something like the creation of God, like a tree. The closer you get to the creation of God, you see not imperfections, but perfections. Greater intricacies, greater signs of design. So you get a little bit closer, you get to a lee and see how beautiful it is. Perfectly designed and formed. But then you get even closer under a microscope and you see the veins, you see the chlorophyll. And then you can get even closer, can't you? Uh, you can see... Um, uh, 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 um, uh, even down to the molecules and the proteins and the atoms contained within. The closer you get to God's design, the more beauty that you see. And it's the same with the Word of God. The closer you get to the Word of God, the more focused you become, the more, the more you zero in, the more beauty you see, the more intricacies you see, the more signs of divine, uh, divine design and perfections there are, there are within it. You know, there's so many overlapping themes, corroborating accounts, harmony in the message from the beginning to the end. And it is beautifully harmonized together. And you can think, how can 66 books by about 40 different authors who lived in different places at different times, spoke different languages, most not knowing each other, create a single collection of books that are so intricately woven together, but without contradiction, but contain such a beautiful synchronicity between them. It's because the same Holy Spirit inspired and guided them in what they wrote, and it was actually the divine hand of God who authored the whole of this Word of God that we look into every Sunday morning. And so as I say, it's the closer you get to God's Word, the more wonders, beauty and pattern emerge from its pages and you see the patterns and this is what happens when you start looking at the numbers you start to see the patterns you start to see the intricacies you start to see the beauty of God's design and this divine fingerprint of God contained within I mean did you know that the numbers in the Bible specifically 1 to 10 have a spiritual meaning attached to them that the first use of a number in scripture invariably gives the clue to its spiritual meaning that uh, these numbers, when doubled, tripled, and uh, generally carry the same spiritual meaning, but intensified. And that there is something called spiritual arithmetic, where you can multiply numbers contained within words, and it shows you a divine pattern within. God has embedded multiples of numbers in passages to convey meaning. And hopefully I'll be able to show you some of that this morning. So, part one this morning is going to be on numerology. Part two is on going to be gematria, which is more to do with calculations and so forth. And so we're going to go through uh, these numbers, 1 to 10, and we're going to throw in 12, 13, and 40. There's other numbers I could throw in there, but we've got limited time. So let's focus in on number one. And one is uh, the number of unity, it is the number of primacy, and it's the number of beginning. So unity. Um, uh, one is the number of unity. One excludes all difference. It is indivisible. With one, there is no second with which you can cause harmony or conflict. And Paul, when describing the unity of the Holy Spirit, he says in Ephesians 4, verses 3 to 6, keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Unity is summed up in that number one. But one is also the number of primacy. You know, it's, it's, the, 
it, and it, is, it speaks of being foremost, ahead and, and, and before all things. And so one is, uh, I mean, if we were to go to Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You know, it's, it's talking about how God is first. He is primacy over all creation and over all beings. You know, the very first commandment in Exodus 20, verse 3, is you shall have no other gods before me. He has primacy ahead of all other things. He comes first, one, the number of primacy. In other words, I have to be first. God stands unique, independent, all-sufficient before all things. And you know, in Isaiah 44, verse 6, God the Father is called the first. He has primacy. Interestingly, in Revelation 1, verse 17, Jesus Christ is called the first. Why is Jesus Christ called the first? Because he is, he is before all things. And why is God in Isaiah called the first? Because he is before all things. Use those two verses on Jehovah's Witnesses. How can Jesus be given the same title as God in, in Isaiah? It's because Jesus is God. So one precedes all other numbers. Thus, all other numbers are dependent upon one and have their origin in one. Do you know what I mean? No, two is dependent upon one. You've got to have two ones to get a two. And you need to have three ones to get a three. All other numbers are dependent upon one. And all other numbers have their origin in one. And so it is that God, who is one, precedes all of creation. And all of creation are dependent on the one God and have their origin in the one God. And one uh, signifies beginning as well. Creation began when? On day one, the first day. And in the beginning, what? God. In the beginning, God, and God who is one. Isaiah 43, verse 10 says, Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. One is the source of beginning. God is the source of beginning. And one marks the beginning of the new creation, our very salvation as well. For by one spirit we were all baptised into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and, all, and, uh, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. One speaks of beginning, and it speaks about our beginning, our salvation as well. Okay then, let's move on. What is the next number? The number two. What is the significance of number two? Well, it has two, it has two meanings attached to it. One is division and the other is witness. Uh, when we uh, trust in the Saviour for salvation, we become separated from those who did not trust in Jesus for salvation. We become divided because of who we have believed in. So two speaks of division. There are only ever two types of people who exist in this world, those who believe and those who don't believe. And there is a division between them. Two, the number of division. In Exodus 8, it says, I will put a division between my people and your people. A division. And in Genesis 1, verse 7, uh, it, it talks about, uh, Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters. So he made the firmament, divided the waters which were under the firmament and the waters which were above the firmament. When did that happen? Day two. Day two, God brought division. Division with the waters. Two is the number of division. There are, only, there are any number of divisions <laughs> uh, by, by the number two in scripture. There were two mountains in Deuteronomy 11 which were a division between the blessing and cursing. There were two trees in the Garden of Eden indicating a division between life and death. There were two men, the wise men and the foolish men, indicating a division between those who build their life based upon Jesus and those who don't build their life upon Jesus. And of course in Hebrews 4 verse 12 we read about a two-edged sword which brings division. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So two is the number of division, but it is also the number of witness. In the Mosaic Law, I'm sure you're aware that you need a minimum of two witnesses, uh, two people as a witness in any legal matter. In Joshua, um, 
uh, he sent out two spies in the land to bring back a witness of what they saw in the land. Uh, Jesus sent out his disciples in, pair, in pairs, in twos, as a witness of him and of the message of the kingdom. Two angels were a witness against Sodom. Two angels were present at the resurrection as a witness. Two angels were pre present at the ascension as a witness. Two angels are on the Ark of a Covenant, witnessing the presence of God. And of course, in the tribulation, you have the two witnesses. Okay, then. Let's move on. Number three. Three is uh, the number of completeness, but more specifically, it is the number of God. Looking at the number of completeness, a Jewish year is completed in three pilgrimage feasts. The tabernacle is complete in three sections, the outer court, then through to the holy place before you get to the most holy place. The human being is complete in three parts, body, soul, spirit. If you don't have one of those, you're not a proper human being. Uh, if you don't have a body here this morning, then you're not a human being. If you don't have a soul here this morning, you're not a human being. And praise God, by the Spirit of God, we have a spirit that's been awoken. Jesus completed his work of salvation on the third day. Jesus completed his earthly ministry after three years. And on the third day of creation, the land rose from the sea and appeared, as Jesus rose from the dead and appeared on the third day. Salvation is completed in three stages. Justification, sanctification, and glorification. Long words, if you want to know what they mean, talk to Ian. <laughs> but three is also the number of God, and this is more important than completeness. God is one in three people, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God has three great attributes, omniscience, omnipresence, omnipotence. Long words. If you want to know what they mean, talk to Ian. There are only th uh, there, that, that Jesus has three offices: prophet, priest, and king. And Jesus, uh, interestingly, have I got it here? Yeah, I do. Interestingly, three times Jesus is described as a shepherd. He's described as a good shepherd, the great shepherd, and the chief shepherd. I've got the references there. Interestingly, when he's referred to as the Good Shepherd, it's in the context of talking about his death. When he's being described as the Great Shepherd, it's in the context of his resurrection. And when he's described as the Chief Shepherd, it's, it's in the context of his return or his appearing at the time of the rapture. So, very much, three is the number of God, and three is one of the two most important numbers in the Bible, along with seven. Okay, then, let's go on to number four. And number four is uh, to do with earth or creative works. So um, there are four points of the gold compass. North, south, east, and four seasons of the year. Spring, summer, autumn, and winter. There are four great earthly kingdoms spoken of in Daniel, both in chapter 2 and chapter 7. Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome. If you want to know more about that, talk to Ian. There are four types of spiritual soil in the parable of the soya, uh, sower. Parable of the soya, that's a vegan version of that parable. Um, four elements on earth, earth, air, fire, and water. And there are four types of created beings. There's fish, birds, beasts, and... Hmm? Humans, thank you. Yes, you know... you. Know yourself, that's good. And on the fourth day of creation, God completed his creation of the earth. The last two days were spent populating the earth. So four is the number of creative works or the number of the earth. There we go. Um, on to number five. So five is the number of grace. God's grace towards Noah was shown in that the ark floated on the water for five months. God's grace to Israel was worked out in five different sacrifices. You can read about those in Leviticus chapters 1 to 5. God's grace to Israel was extended through five covenants he made specifically with them. God's grace to Israel is shown in that the Lord promises that five men will chase 100 enemies. And God's grace to the multitude of 5,000 was shown in that they were fed by five loaves. Five's the number of grace. Number six... And number six is the number of man. 
Man was created on which day? Sixth day, yes. The sixth commandment is the prohibition of murder. So man is created on the sixth day, man is killed on the sixth. There are six different words for man in the Bible. Oh no, I've gone, jumped ahead, let's go back. Six different words for man in the Bible. Four are in the Old Testament, two are in the New. Four are Hebrew, two are Greek. You've got Adam, uh, uh, you've got Ish, you've got Enosh, Gever, Anthropos, and Anair. And you've got the references there where those different names for man are there. But six, the number of man. And there were six cities of refuge that man could run to for safety in Numbers 35. Okay, so now we move on to number seven. Seven is the second of the most important numbers in the Bible. In fact, I would say seven is the most important number in the Bible. It is the number of spiritual perfection. The entire word of God is littered with examples of seven. You barely turn a page without seeing a seven somewhere. And seven is used to group uh, and count so many things within the Bible. It's as if the entire infrastructure of the Bible is built around the number seven. There are seven days in the creation account. Seven men lived to over 900. Seven people were called twice in the Bible. Abraham, Abraham, Jacob, Jacob, Moses, Moses, Samuel, Samuel, Martha, Martha, Simon, Simon, Saul, Saul. There were seven fat years and seven lean years in Pharaoh's dream and Joseph's interpretation. There are seven characteristics of the Holy Spirit in Isaiah 11. There are seven miracles in John's Gospel. Seven times angels appeared during Jesus' ministry. Seven I am statements of Jesus through his ministry. Seven sayings of Jesus on the cross. And that's not even going anywhere near Revelation. Seven stars, seven spirits, seven angels, seven churches, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls, seven thunders, and it goes on and on and on. Seven's everywhere. It is core to the Bible, the number seven. Number of spiritual perfection. So it's three and seven, remember, the most important numbers. And interestingly, the word seven, it occurs 287 times in the Bible, which is a multiple of seven. It's 41 times seven. The word seventh occurs 98 times in the Bible, which is a multiple of seven, 14 by seven. And the word sevenfold occurs seven times in the Bible, which is a multiple of seven. It's seven multiplied by one. Great, you can do maths. And if you add 287, 998, 287, 98 and seven together, anybody know what that is? No. Close. Three? Three, nine, two, absolutely. Three, nine, two. But the thing is, three, nine, two is seven squared by seven cubed, uh, which is 49 plus three, four, three. So you can see how seven is just so embedded in scripture that whichever way you look, seven is, there's multiples of seven throughout scripture. We'll be doing more of this stuff a little bit later on. Okay then, number seven, on to number eight. Okay then, so eight is the number of resurrection. Uh, when the earth died in the flood, it was Noah, the eighth from Adam, according to Peter, who was the vessel through whom resurrection came to man. And there were eight people on the ark through whom the human race was resurrected. And there are eight accounts of individuals being resurrected in scripture individuals three in the old testament three in the gospels and two in acts and we've got a list of them all there and of course jesus is heavily linked uh, to the number eight because he is uh, the resurrection and the life after the passion week jesus was re resurrected on the eighth day and after a further 40 days jesus was ascended 40 being a multiple of eight, five times eight. And we're even gonna see that his name adds up to the number 888 later on. So eight is the number of resurrection. Okay, on to number nine. Are you guys doing okay with this? Is this okay? You're not falling asleep? Okay, good. So nine is the number of fullness. 
So the fullness of the Holy Spirit is summed up in the fruit of the Spirit. How many aspects of the fruit of the Spirit do you think there are? Nine. How many gifts of the Holy Spirit do you think there are in 1 Corinthians 12? Nine. Absolutely. Jesus died on which hour? Yes. The fullness of sin was paid um, on, on the ninth hour. Praise God. So the number of fullness. Okay, on to number 10. Okay, so 10 has a couple of meanings. Per, number of perfect order and man's testing. Can you, anything, can you think of anything that's ordered by 10 in the Bible? Commandments, absolutely. So we've got the Ten Commandments. Um, there were ten plagues that were poured out on um, Egypt. And uh, there are ten clauses in the Lord's Prayer. And as you work those out in your mind, uh, the ten is also the number of man's testing. So um, 40 is the number of God's testing. Ten is the number of man's testing. So the number of rebellions at the hands of men by Israel, uh, well, by Israel in the wilderness was ten. There were ten rebellions by Israel in the wilderness. The number of kingdoms in the last human empire is ten. You read about that in Daniel 7. If you want to know more, talk to Ian. Uh, the number of days that the persecuted church in Revelation 2 uh, is tested is 10 days. You see, what happens is um, God tests his people 40 days so that they are ready to be able to endure the 10 days of testing by man. If you know about the SAS, they will go you through intense training, but the training that you'll experience under the SAS is far greater than any, um, anything that they are uh, destined to experience in the field. They're tested be beyond what they're expected to meet, so they're ready for anything in the field. And that's what God does with us. He tests us for 40 days, so we're, we're prepared above and beyond whatever man can throw us in those 10 days of testing. Okay, that's 10. Uh, three more to go. The number 12. Pardon? The best number, you think? Can you think of anything that's 12 in the Bible, Isaac? Nothing at all? 12 disciples, very good. Yes, so there were 12 tribes in Israel. In fact, there were 12 patriarchs before the tribes. Um, the number of Jesus' apostles is 12. The number of gates and foundations in the New Jerusalem is, guess what, 12. And the number of judges that governed Israel in the book of Judges was 12. So 12 is the number of government. And then 13. Oh, 13 is the number of rebellion. Uh, the year in which people rebelled against the rule of Chedeleoma in Genesis was the 13th year. Solomon built the Lord's temple in seven years, but in, he built his palace in 13 years. And we see that as he went further on, he rebelled against the Lord. While there were 12 judges in the book of Judges, 12 judges in the book of Judges appointed by God, there was actually a 13th judge, a man called Abimelech, who appointed himself, and he was a rebellious man. 13th judge, a rebellious man. And of the 20 kings who reigned in the kingdom of Judah, Seven were good kings. How many were bad kings? Thirteen. There were thirteen bad or rebellious kings in the kingdom of Judah as well. Thirteen, the number of rebellion. And then finally, number forty. We've already touched upon it. Forty is the number of God's testing. So the number of days the earth was tested with rain during the flood was forty. The number of years Moses was tested in Midian was 40. The number of days the spies were tested as they scouted the promised land was? The number of years Israel were tested as they sojourned through the wilderness was? The number of days Goliath tested Israel with his taunts was? The number of days Nineveh was tested under Jonah's ministry was what, Johnny? 40. He knows that he taught that book. If you want to know more about Jonah, talk to, talk to Johnny. The number of days Jesus was tested in the wilderness was 40. So 40 is the number of testing. Um, so as I said, the most important of the numbers is 3 and 7. And 3 being the number of God and 7 being the number of spiritual perfection. Now I've got no idea 
how long I've been talking for. Can I keep going or do you want me to wrap it up? Sorry? 20 minutes to go? Okay, right. Okay, right. So, part two, Gematria. Gematria is uh, assigning numbers to letters, words and phrases, then seeing significance in them. So in England, we have an alphabet for letters and we have numbers or numerals for counting, don't we? But in Hebrew and Greek, their alphabet and numerals are combined so that each letter is designated a number, thus they can count using their letters. So let's look at the Hebrew alphabet there. You can see all the letters, you can see the symbols, you can see their, um, how they will be pronounced, and you can see the numerical number that is assigned to them. And so you can see that every word in the Hebrew um, uh, language has a numerical value. You can add up the number of the letters and work out what the numerical value is of that name, that word, that place, that person. And what can we do with this? Well, let's look here at Genesis 2, verse 24. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So the name for father is Ab, and uh, it's c combined of two letters, the Aleph and the Bat. The Aleph is a numerical value of one. Bet has a numerical value of two. So what's the numerical value for the word father? Three, absolutely. But we've also got mother in that sentence as well. Uh, the, that word is M, made up of two Hebrew letters, the Aleph and the Mem. Aleph is worth one point, and Mem is, has a value of 40. So what's the numerical value for the word mother? 41, absolutely. Now, in Genesis 21, verse 8, we've got this. And the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham was made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. So now, what's interesting is, the word for child there is yeled, which is made of yod, lamed, and dalet, numerical values of 10, 30, and 4, which when you add up makes 44. So when you add the totals of mother and father together, you get the total of child. You put father and mother together, you get child. 3 plus 41 is 44. And so that's the way that the Hebrew language works. There's all these patterns contained within scripture and you can add them together and it reveals God's divine hand, his fingerprint in the word. Um, this is the one that everybody likes to talk about. Um, I, I've, I came across this through the writings of Dr. Ivan Panin. Um, he was the first guy who did really good research on numerology. He went a bit far, so be careful with numerology because you can go a bit OTT, but you can look at that afterwards if you want to. Another guy that's been a big help is E.W. Bullinger. He's, this is a very good book, although, again, Bullinger goes a bit too far, and there's a few things that Bullinger has said about other topics which I'm not too keen upon as well. And there's another guy here, R.T. Nash, or Nash, and he's done a lot of work on it in a book called Spiritual Arithmetic. So you can look at any of those if you want to. But I got first introduced to this topic by Roger Price. And uh, Roger Price is a Bible teacher, founder of Chichester Christian Fellowship. He's, he's really responsible for a lot of the Bible understanding that I first had when I first became a Christian. And I know he was a big influence upon Ian and Francis as well. Anyway, it was Ivan Panin that showed me this verse here that uh, says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now, in the Hebrew, it looks like this, reading from that side that way, because they go the different way in Hebrew. So you can see the letters there, and you can see the numerical value of each of those words. Now, at the moment, that doesn't mean much to you, but when you look at it, divide it in half, you see that there are 14 letters on one side and 14 letters on the other. 14 is a multiple of 7, the spiritual perfection, 2 times 7. So there's a spiritual symmetry in that passage. Um, there's also seven words, and the total value there is 2,701 for all those words, which is 37 times 73. What did I say were the two most important numbers in the Bible? 7 and 3. So we can see here a numeric perfection within this opening verse of Genesis. 
but it doesn't end there. The middle word there is the first and the last letters of the Hebrew alphabet, the Aleph and the Tav, a title of God. The very title of God is right there in the middle of this opening verse of the Bible. But either side of these two words, uh, or that middle word, is two words with, the new, uh, with five letters. So if you group those together, you group those together, you get seven again. So there's a nice pattern and symmetry there. Um, and I think this is part of the God's hand of design in the word of God. But if you look at the third word, and the fifth word, and the seventh word, God, the heavens, and the earth, the third word has five letters, the fifth word has five letters, the fourth, so the seventh word has four letters, that's a total of 14 letters, which is another multiple of seven, seven times two, but you add up their value, 86, 395, 296, it gives you a total of 777, seven being the number of spiritual perfection, but also 777 is a multiple of 37 times three times seven, using those two most uh, important numbers in spiritual numerology. So we see there all these patterns contained within uh, that first verse. Um, but it doesn't end there. The word, uh, words one and three um, total 999, which is a multiple of 37 by three by three by three. The f words two, four, and five, they total 999. Again, the same combinations of 37 times three, three, three. These are the most important numbers in the Bible, three and seven, as I said. Add words six and seven together, total of 703 which is another multiple of 37. Add words three, five, and six together. That's 888, which is another multiple of 37. And so we're seeing all these kind of overlapping calculations in there. The third and the fourth words together, total seven letters. The fourth, fourth and the fifth words, seven letters. Sixth and seven words, seven letters. Have I got anything else there? I can't remember. Yes, the value or the numeric value of the first and the last letters of all seven words combined is 1393, which is set a multiple of seven. Uh, the numeric value of the first and last letters of the first and last words is 497, which is a multiple of seven. The numeric value of the only verb in there, which is the word created, um, has a value of 203, which is a multiple of seven. The numeric value of the last letters of the first and last words is 490, which is a multiple of seven. So it's just seven after seven after seven, layered and laid and multiples, whichever way you look at it. So there are so many patterns of seven here. You know, the number of words in this sentence is seven, and there are 28 letters, which is divisible by seven. And it just goes on, and I can't, I can't read it all out to you. But it, it's just, it, it just shows you how, just in this very first verse, verse, whichever way you look at it, sevens are overlapping, showing God's fingerprint and divine hand upon it. Um, Dr. Ivan Panin said this, every complete passage of the scripture in the Old Testament Hebrew is built upon a design of sevens. It's enmeshed in there. And you know, you, one might be inclined to dismiss such a pattern as chance. I can, I can, I can, I can hear the, the criticism and the doubt and the disbelief. It's an accidental phenomenon. However, the statistical likelihood of this being random is so remote as to be impossible. It is a sign of God's hand of design in the scriptures. No other book in the world has been found that is constructed on such a numerical pattern. It's interesting, if you take the Apocrypha and try to do the same sort of calculations, there's no trace of this design whatsoever. It's only in the Hebrew scriptures and in the Greek scriptures that you're gonna find this sort of pattern and design. Dr. Panin was an agnostic, but he decided to put the word of God to test. And along with two more Hebrew scholars, they spent 13 weeks trying to compose a simple passage with multiples of seven in it. At the end of that, they found that they couldn't do it. All that they produced was nonsensical drivel. Human endeavor can't produce this pattern, this design. Only the God of scripture can put a design like this in the word of God. It shows you it's a divinely authored book. And the net result of this is that Dr. Ivan Panin surrendered his life to Jesus Christ and became a born-again Christian. Hallelujah. Okay, very quickly. The Greek is just like um, the Hebrew. Um, they use letters for numbers. And there are 24 Greek letters. Um, however, for the purpose of counting, three extra letters were included. The three extra letters there are in yellow. But as you can see, Every word in the, 
in the Greek New Testament will have a numerical value as a result of this, um, this alphabet numerical system that's combined. So let's look at this. And an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She'll give birth to a son and you'll give to give to him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Okay, so it might have been Mary and Joseph that named their son, but where did they get the name from? They got the name from heaven. God himself told Joseph to call Jesus, Jesus. And as you can imagine, Jesus has some significance. It, is, it means God is salvation. But if you look at the numerical value of his name in Greek, 10, 8, 20, 70, 40, and 20, it totals 888. 8 is obviously the number of resurrection. When 8 is doubled or tripled, it intensifies that. Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. He is the God of resurrection. He is the resurrection of life. So even in his name, his numerical value adds up to a number of significance. But if we were to go through the first 11 verses of the Bible, and I'm not going to read that out to you, and I'm not asking anybody else to read it out to you because it's just all names. It's a genealogy of Jesus from Abraham to uh, the captivity in Babylon. And it's one of those things, whenever you look at a genealogy, you just groan. You just think, oh, good grief. And you wade through it if you're a good Christian, or you jump over it if you're not such a good Christian. And you think, is there really any significance in this whatsoever? Well, let me tell you that the number of Greek voc vocabulary words used in these verses is 49, or 7 times 7. The total number of letters in these 49 words is exactly 266, which is a multiple of 7. The number of words beginning with a vowel is 28, which is a multiple of 7. The number of words beginning with a consonant is 21, which is a multiple of 7. The number of consonants is 126, which are multiple of seven. The number of vowels among these uh, 20, 266 letters is 140, which is a multiple of seven. The number of words which occur more than once is 35, which is a multiple of seven. The number of words occurring only once is 14, which is a multiple of seven. The number of nouns which occur are 42, which is a multiple of seven. The number of words which are not nouns that occur is seven, which is a multiple of seven. The number of nouns which are proper names is 35, which is a multiple of seven. And the number of male names is 28, which is a multiple of seven. Seven is just embedded in this passage like you wouldn't believe. To us it is boring, to God it is beautiful, and his fingerprint is all over it. There are three women mentioned in here, Tamar, Rahab, and Ruth. The number of Greek letters in these three names is 14, which is a multiple of seven. And the type of numerical underpinning of scripture cannot be duplicated by human endeavor. It is the evidence of divine origin. And if you don't believe me, prove me wrong. Go home, get a pen and paper, put out the letters, assign numbers to them, and try to write a sentence which has these kind of numerical calculations to them. I guarantee it, you won't be able to produce it. The only way a man can produce such a feat as this is under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The Word of God was authored by God, and we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit so that we can properly understand it. It is the same Holy Spirit that rose Jesus from the dead, resurrected, number 8, 888. Eight, eight. The same Spirit lives inside of us, and that Spirit will unlock the Word of God to us and help us to see the glo glories and riches that uh, are contained within. Now, you don't have to understand biblical numerology. Um, oh, I've got those there. I forgot that. Um, you don't have to understand biblical numerology to see God's hand in the Word of God. You merely have to read it with faith. If you read the Word of God with faith, then the Holy Spirit will unlock it to you and show you wonderful, glorious things. We shouldn't get too excited or carried away with um, this sort of subject. That's what Panin and Bullinger have done, and it became obsessive to them. And I should forewarn you that anything that God does 
the enemy invariably um, tries to counterfeit. And there is numerology within the occult as well, which is why I advise caution on this subject. But I, I pray that this blesses you this morning, and I pray that it helps to boost your faith and confidence in the Word of God. But I think the biggest problem that Christians, that people have, is not seeing the numbers, but just not reading the plain words of Scripture. Just read the Word of God and God will open it up to you. If there's anybody here this morning that doesn't know the Lord, uh, let me tell you that He is real and He desires a relationship with you this morning. He has put His divine fingerprint upon the Word of God, but He wants to put His divine fingerprint upon your life. He wants to save you from sin and judgment and bring you to a place of salvation. And the way that happens is by turning to him in faith and repenting of your sins. If you want to know more about that, come and speak to me afterwards, please. And if there is anybody in church this morning that needs prayer for any subject, whether you want to confess what that problem is or, or what your need is, or whether you just want to keep it private and just want some prayer, Jackie and Ray are going to be standing over there for five to ten minutes um, at the end of the service so that you can uh, go and pray with them. Okay then, that is that for this morning. I'm going to close with a word of prayer and then we can break for teas and coffees. Father God, we want to thank you for the numbers in the Bible. We want to thank you, Lord, that they are an indicator that you have designed and written this word. And we pray, Father God, that you'd help us to be good and faithful students of your word. Fill us with your spirit and help us to hear your voice speaking to us through the passages of Scripture, that it would be light and life to us. Lord, you tell us that we should uh, learn to number our days. Man is allotted three score, year and ten, eighty if he has the strength. Help us to count every individual day and make it count for you, I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much.